The floor of the world's oceans, once thought to have a simple form, is veined by a network of ridges, the longest and most extensive tectonic features on Earth. In part one, we saw that these ridges are sites where new seafloor, new parts of tectonic plates, are being created. They are the so-called constructive plate boundaries, the sites of seafloor spreading. But this recognition is only the start of a story of plate tectonics and of understanding the geological structure of the ocean floor. This idea that the Earth's surface was crisscrossed by constructive plate boundaries was established in the 1960s. And moving into the next decade, constructive plate boundaries are considered to be narrow, exemplified by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, illustrated here in 21st century mapping. But what's the geological structure? How is new seafloor created? It's this question we'd like to address in this video. So we can begin where we left off at the end of part one, with the discovery of stripes of magnetic anomalies arranged symmetrically across mid-ocean ridges, recording the flips in polarity in the Earth's magnetic field, normal and reverse. A barcode tape recorder locked into the rocks of the seabed. But what's the tape? What are the rocks that are doing the recording? What's the seabed made of? We can step back for a minute to 1961 and Bob Dates coining the term seafloor spreading. In this paper, he contrasted the typical crust of continents with that of the oceans. So let's zoom into the oceans. The numbers that Dites wrote on his diagram that I've hidden behind the colours are the density and the velocity at which seismic waves are transmitted through the materials, information that is gained remotely by geophysical measurements. At the top is seawater, four to five kilometres of it. At the bottom, uncoloured, is the mantle. And between is a crust of around seven kilometres thick, a thin veneer of sediments on top of igneous rocks, that's basalts and gabbro, that were known from a handful of dredge samples. So it was igneous rocks erupted on the seabed and intruded from below that record the magnetic reversals. But this image doesn't explain the structure of the crust in any detail, so the forming processes at this stage remained unknown. Move on a decade and the hunt for the structure of ocean crust was on. And this hunt turned to the land, where rocks could be readily studied. And in this, an important study was compiled by John Dewey and Jack Bird, then colleagues at New York State University at Albany. They were actually working on the geological structure of the ancient Caledonian mountain belt, so on collision tectonics. And they found slices of what they believe were former ocean crust caught up in their mountain belt system. In presenting their findings, they first compiled information on the layer crust in the oceans, like this. And then they went on to compare this information with sections of possible ocean crust caught up in the old mountain belt. Geologists call these maroon segments of former ocean floor ophiolites. And for Dewey and Bird, rather than find a single type of ocean crust, as appeared to be the case when considering marine seismology. The outcrop example showed lots of variations. Now, for sceptics, they might be asked how much of these variations is reflective of seafloor geology and how much is a product of deformation, dismemberment and slicing during the incorporation of these rocks into the mountain belt. We can remain on land but turn to another ophiolite and back to Fred Fine. We met Fred in part one. He first calibrated seafloor spreading with those magnetic anomaly stripes. But now we're finding Fred partnered with Eldridge Moores, 
who was working on ophiolites within the so-called Franciscan Belt in California. But Fred and Eldridge turned their attention to the Trudos Mountains of Cyprus, building on the recently published geological memoir produced by Ian Gass. And this is their summary, a layered oceanic crust, submarine basalts, that's pillow larvas, on top, along with sediments, peridotite, mantle rocks at the base, and in between, intrusive rocks of distinct composition and structure. And within this, the key components are the so-called sheeted dikes, intrusion into intrusion into intrusion, which records splitting open, fracturing the crust, and then filling this fracture with batches of magma again and again and again. So the dikes are the fingerprints of seafloor spreading of the creation of new oceanic crust in a systematic fashion. Presumably the dikes fed the pillar lavas above and were in turn fed from magma chambers, the gabbros below. Fractionation in the magma chamber leaves denser crystals, the ultra basics, at the base. Interestingly, for seismic waves, the ultra basics look like peridotites, so the base of the crust determined geophysically would be here. But in terms of minerals and origin, the true moho, the crustal base, is here. Nevertheless, these are the key components of the true dosophilite. And it fits the available information on constructive plate boundaries. So for many, the true dos became the type example of oceanic crust, even though it's no longer part of the ocean floor. Although for some, it was debatable whether it was actually formed at a mid-ocean ridge at all, but that was very much a minority view. And the Trudos went on to inform an ideal model of oceanic crust, agreed at a conference held in the early 1970s. This is the so-called Penrose model, published anonymously by the conference participants. And you'll find this in textbooks ever since. Oceanic crust, about six kilometres thick, with consistent layering and its sheeted dikes that are the key component for understanding how plates are constructed. But hang on a minute, what of all that variety compiled by Dewey and Bird? Now, to a great extent, their aim was to use ophiolites not as proxies for seafloor, but to identify sites of former oceans in ancient orogenic belts, essentially as paleogeographic markers. But for ocean structure, does the variety outcrop reflect real complexity of seafloor geology? The question was largely avoided for almost a quarter of a century. There's a tendency amongst some, maybe most scientists, to seek simplicity, unified theories and type examples. So let's challenge that convention. We can now go on to see that the geology and tectonics of constructed plate boundaries is far more interesting. A single model isn't enough. And we can start back with Bob Dent's layered model and the seven kilometre thick crust, also incorporated into the Penrose model. And the crust of the Atlantic seabed changes along its length. It isn't constant. This is recognised here. Why the change in thickness? We can quickly reprise ideas covered in greater detail elsewhere, and you can check out these in a different video. Upwelling mantle under mid-ocean ridges decompresses, and if the rocks do this quickly, they begin to melt, crossing a so-called solidus. In the scenario sketched here, about 20% of the mantle that does this will melt, creating a melt layer in other words, oceanic crust, about six kilometres thick. So this is the conventional way in which oceanic crust is formed. But if the upwelling mantle is hotter than normal, the same process generates more melt, so thicker crust. So thick oceanic crust is formed above hotter mantle, hotspots. So one way of creating different types, or at least different thicknesses of oceanic crust, is to start with mantle at different temperatures. We can follow this further with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. As we move up the Rechiana segment of the ridge towards Iceland, the crustal thickness increases. Notice that the ridge now is less segmented. There are fewer transform faults. 
We'll see there's a relationship between transform segmentation and magma later on, but let's continue our journey onshore onto Iceland, where the constructive plate boundary rises above sea level. And we'll use recent insights published by Freystein Sigmundsen and colleagues of the University of Iceland. This is the geology with young volcanics in red, tracked by recorded earthquakes. Coming in from the southwest, that's the Reykjanes Ridge, earthquakes form a narrow zone, a narrow plate boundary. But look in southern Iceland. The earthquakes spread out over a wide area. Now let's look at actual plate motions recorded by repeated GPS surveys. Keeping the east side fixed, the west side moves off to the west-northwest. If all this relative motion happened in a narrow zone, then these arrows should be the same length, but they're not. And this variation is even more dramatic on the south side of Iceland. This time, keep the west side fixed and the amount of relative east-southeast motion varies too. Iceland is stretching apart, not simply along a narrow zone. So the plate boundary here is a broader zone of plate stretching that's not predicted by the simple model. OK, back to melting. We've seen the hotter mantle makes for more crust. But these understandings rely on decompression happening quickly so that the rising mantle retains its thermal energy. It doesn't diffuse away to the surface. For most strain rates, this is fine because rocks hold on to heat very efficiently. But what if the decompression is slow? The decompressing mantle could then diffuse heat away as it approaches the surface. So that if it happens slow enough, it would never cross the solidus. In other words, it wouldn't melt. No melt, no crust, so no dikes. So then what structures would accommodate the plate divergence? Let's examine a different style of plate structure where mantle rocks, not pillow basalts, lie on the seabed. We're off to the Atlantis Fracture Zone in the Mid-Atlantic and a research cruise in the mid-1990s. Two papers came from this by Donna Blackman and by Joe Can and colleagues. So here's the bathymetric map. It's a dramatic feature on the seabed. And here's the tectonic setting. And the focus was on the so-called inside corner high, the Atlantis Massif, it's a five kilometre high mountain on the seabed. That's the size of Mont Blanc. The surface of the massif is scraped, sculpted by corrugations that are parallel to the relative plate motion. And we can flip back and look from the north. This is an exhumed fault surface over 10 kilometres across. And this is Joe Can's cross section. He shows a low angle normal fault that has exposed deep rocks, including mantle, on the seabed. Pulled apart, presumably too slowly for the rising mantle to melt, even though, obviously, it's been decompressed. The message is that ridges at transform offsets have reduced magmatism. So let's step back from Atlantis and consider more of the ridge segmented at transforms. So if magma generation is concentrated away from the transforms, it will have this pattern. This presumably is not because of differences in mantle temperature, not at that length scale, but in strain rate. So what came first, the transform segmentation controlling melting or melt patching controlling the segments? It's an interesting problem. Clearly, the mantle below this part of the Atlantic is only just able to create new crust. OK, so where have we got to? Let's look back at the compilation we've been using so far that begins to address the variety of ocean crust structure. It's part of a review by Réjean Herbet of the Université Laval in Quebec. He shows different types of ocean crust, beginning to capture the variety that we've had a tour around so far. Right, let's go back to a global view 
and Maria Seaton and colleagues compilation of oceanic tectonics. From the age of the seabed, they worked out spreading rates that could be classified as fast spreading in red through slow, much like the Atlantic that's in green, to ultra slow in blue. And to study ultra slow spreading in an active ridge system, it's off to the Southwest Indian Ridge. It's a very rough bathymetric landscape and dredge samples have discovered lots of mantle on the seabed. To get a more detailed picture, we'll turn side on, so north is to the left. This map compilation is by Tim Reston and shows the seabed relief is over four kilometres. Some areas it's smooth and some areas it's rough and rugged. Reston explains it like this. OK, it's a complex diagram, but it actually makes a really simple point. The smooth areas on the seabed are fault surfaces, just like Donna Blackman and Joe Can showed for Atlantis. But here, it's much of the seabed is fault surface. That's a lot of faults. Now, this is Henry Dick and colleagues' map, showing tracts of mantle, fault surface that is, exposed on the seabed. So ultra-slow spreading exposes mantle. It's faulting that does it, not igneous intrusion. Interestingly, this harks right back to Harry Hess, one of the founders of seafloor spreading, who we saw in video one, and he envisaged upwelling of mantle direct to the seabed. This was all years before the ideas of decompression melting had developed. So, back to ultra-slow spreading. As Henry Dick and colleagues realised, if the divergence is by low angle normal faults, new ocean floor is created asymmetrically by exposed mantle on the foot wall side. This is in dramatic contrast to the classic view derived from magnetic anomaly patterns. Asymmetric seafloor spreading. The global surveys compiled by Maria Seaton and co are detailed enough now to detect the difference. They track out spreading asymmetry. On this map, symmetry, that's new plate equally distributed on either side of the plate boundary, is in green. Strongly asymmetric is in red. The Atlantic, mostly formed magmatically or just about, is systematic and symmetrical. The Southwest India Ridge, in contrast, ultra slow with lots of faulting and lots of asymmetry. So where have we got to? Lots of variations in the tectonics of seafloor spreading and we can glimpse at why. Magma reduction as a consequence of strain rate and not just mantle temperature. Seismology gave us a simple picture, but outcrops said different. And then turning our attention to the ocean crust again, we found those differences. The ocean crust is variable and seeking out this variety has greatly improved understanding of tectonic processes. The search for simplicity and seeking unified models and type examples has been unhelpful in the long run. We learn by embracing the diversity and then trying to explain it. The story continues. Oceanic tectonics are still very much the target of ongoing scientific research.